done under the uh, uh, my uh, advisor Michael Ziff at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's about uh, so the, the flavor of this is mainly uh, number theory and diamondic approximation. So now let me be very vague uh, here because the, 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 the many things will be subject to uh, specification later on. But a new equation, just put in the most general way to say it, uh, or at least the way I understand it, is let R be a ring. I'm not going to satisfy it now. Uh, but it's an equation of a form where x plus y equals 1. Well, this 1 is not so important in terms of normalizing vector. So any x plus y equals any fixed number, your number, that's fine. Uh, but the point is that x and y should range over some subset of R arising from multiplication. Okay, and you will see what that, the, the flavor of those subset will look like <coughs> in a minute. Um, so in, and, and so you want to look at the equation uh, that, of all solution x plus y equals 1. And asking about the, the structure of the solution, it can be viewed as an interplay between the addition structure and the multiplication structure of R. So the important input is you want to have multiplication and addition, and we want to see how they can how they can play. Uh, this is the very typical example of unit equation. So what are the solution uh, of um, you want to have a, a power of two and power of three differ by one? And if you think a little bit, you will find this forward. And but as a non-trivial fact, it turns out that they are all. And it's asserted by some theorems. So, as, although this is very poor, a poor example, but it turns out that uh, think about intuition of this. Uh, this is a very good example you should keep in mind throughout this talk. Okay. So, the unit equation does have this flavor. So, you have some geometric uh, progressions, but then you somehow want to differ by uh, one, which you will feel, you can expect that it should be a very coincidental thing. So, it shouldn't have infinite many solutions. Uh, but of course, usually the thing, the intuition, um, like the, the flavor number theory is a uh, lot of expected things are very hard to prove. And this is, um, this type of thing is also one of them. Although there are already lots of uh, good results of this, which I'm going to say more later, uh, very soon. So again, I'm going to say another umbrella term for the unit equation theorem. It is a theorem. A theorem stating that x plus y plus 1 has only finitely many solutions, assuming some conditions on the sets that x and y range over. But they will always be intimately related to the multiplicative structure uh, of your ring. And there is an ocean of such theorem. So the very uh, uh, first one comes from the, the motivation comes from studying integral points on the curve. And essentially, they should, uh, and then the there are just several others here because uh, they, the, first, the first one is not so general and the, the last one. Uh, the, the, the current general version here is the version uh, by Perry in the uh, 50s. Uh, the early version are not that general. The, the statement is that when x and y are s units in a number field where s is a finite set of prime, so you, are, you only allow certain exponents but uh, from a finite set, you don't allow any other. And then so x plus y plus 1, there are only finitely many solutions. So for this historical reason, uh, a common name for unit equation theorems found in literature is usually called S unit theorem. So from now on, I will refer to the unit equation theorem by S unit theorems. That is the most common way to uh, uh, where this theorem is found. Uh, but it turns out that the key to S unit theorem is not really about S unit. It's really about a finite generation of unit groups. So, uh, the Richelieu theorem states that uh, the set of S units in a number field is finitely generated. And turns out that is the only uh, most important feature we want. So in particular, Lang proves a uh, general statement that when X and Y are in a finitely generated subgroup of the multiple group of complex number, then you have to find this as well. And the first two are sort of ineffective, just say it's finite, but not, not, but not giving um, how many they are, and not giving an exhaustive list. Um, but there are also effective results. There are uh, lots of paper from Biori, lots of paper from Aversive, um, starting, uh, starting at those years. Uh, they basically give 
uh, effective result in terms of bound on the height of solutions. And height is essentially a measure of complexity. And the most important property is that uh, if you give me a height, I can list all the num all the numbers with a bound with that bounded height, uh, and they only find that to be many. Um, so this the reason why it's called effective is because if I give you the bound on the height of solutions, then I have restrict my candidates for a finite set. So you just test the finitely many of them, and you can see all the solutions. So in principle, the, at least that is how the, the exhaustive list of solutions can be determined. Although I mean, I don't say it is computationally uh, doable. Sometimes the bound is actually very huge. But uh, that is the result is called uh, the only reason why it's called effective. Oh, and also they also result on uh, bound on number of solutions as well. So um, every non S unit theorem so far takes place in a commutative ring a field of characteristic zero. Um, well, at least we can put every, embed everything into C. You know, everything things um, that is classically known so far are uh, they happen in, inside C. Um, but one philosophy, uh, at least I view S unit theorem, is so like why it is expected to hold is that. So the body will define some sets of allowed x, y have a flavor of geometric progression, right? So remember a for example again, yeah, some geometric progression, maybe some more complicated ones. Uh, so having, but having lots of solutions like of the form x plus y equals one or equivalently stated x minus y equals one is a feature of arithmetic progressions. And multiplication and additions uh, should be incompatible. Okay? So like in the maybe in the spirit of ABC conjecture, you know, there are some. Um, phenomenon like that should be incompatible. So one shouldn't expect to find arithmetic progression features in geometric progressions. Uh, so, so in, in other words, ha having a solution of the equation should be a coincidence. Uh, but as a thing that happens often, um, many theorems are uh, the same. Like essentially, they are like this way. The coincidences uh, could happen, but not infinitely often. Okay, so unit theorem. Uh, so me, S unit unit theorem fits into a one of such phenomena. So this is how it's expected. Of, of course, uh, as usual, this theorem are um, hard to prove. Um, but you can still expect that S unit theorem still holds even in non-commutative setting. Right? The multiplication become more um, complicated, uh, but the geometric progression still have those um, you know, nature of like. Something discrete, uh, but not so homogeneous as an lattice. You know, like you, you, you still don't quite expect to find as many progressions inside it. And and the, the question here is that can we actually find S unit theorems in any non-commutative associated rings? Um, let me give a couple example. Okay, so this is a ring where unit theorem is not true because if you take the matrix algebra. And you take this non diagonalizable matrix and you take it to a power and you realize that the power uh, in the exponent just becomes uh, an end itself. So the geometric progression in this case happens to be arithmetic progression. And this is already a bad news. Um, but just to let you see more why, uh, like, uh, you could construct some examples uh, using this. For example, 2f minus g plus 1 if you take f to have n and g to have 2. So once you have geometric equation equals arithmetic equation, then like no matter what rules, the SU equation should have hold. So the takeaway of this example is we should really rule out the matrix algebra. So namely, we should consider division algebras. They are sort of um, the opposite. Thing. And in fact, the, the dream is the, the, the dream. Uh, I still expect it to be true is that the the SU equation should hold for any. A division, at least a finite generated division, division algebra over Q. Um, if you take where x y allowed to be any finitely generated subgroup, so that is the dream, and is in, in fact the conjecture I state in the paper. And this is this is the main theorem, which is as much as what I can prove. Uh, so here to state the theorem, uh, recall. Um, uh, I use H for coordinate algebra, the standard one over R. So there's only one. That one, okay. So and uh, it is equipped with uh, the Archimedean norm, um, which is the Euclidean one. Uh, it is multiplicative, 
And here, I let HA denote the set of quaternions whose all four coordinates are real algebraic numbers. Okay, and this, this is a, a technical assumption I had just because I did that. So the theorem is that let gamma 1, gamma 2 be finitely generated semi group of uh, the multiple group of algebraic quaternions. Uh, by semi group, I mean the powers are allowed to be non negative, but not negative. Um, they are generated by, uh, I want them to be generated by norm, elements of norms greater than 1. And, um, and, that, and next, I fix A, B, A prime, B prime, um, just as, ju just as, um, like, as much as flexibility I can add with theorem. And then consider the unit equation of the form AX, A prime plus B, Y, B prime equals 1. And then, the case I can prove is if one of the group is commutative, so let's say gamma 1 is commutative, then it has only finitely many solutions. And the main thing why I need commutativity is, uh, is the observation that being commutative is the same as contained in a copy of C in H. Right? So if you have a bunch of commutative elements and you join that to R, you'll get a commutative sub-algebra, but the largest commutative sub-algebra of H is C. But there are more than one copy, so if you join anywhere, you get a copy of C. So um, um, this is the statement of the theorem. Uh, this is a typical case of what it looks like. Uh, you have some elements with not bigger than one, and I want F1, F2 to commute. So then one of them can be stated in power because they commute, but the other one uh, must be words. And because they are semi groups, so all the power active and all the words cannot evolve uh, their inverse. Okay, so this is the. Uh, so you can see that even though one of them is commutative, but the whole theorem is still very non commutative. Because A, A prime, B, and B prime are. Uh, they don't have to commute with anything. And then uh, Y is a, a word that you see, you see there's a huge flexibility there. Okay, so this is the statement of theorem that even with all this flexibility, it is, uh, there's only finitely many solutions. So is there any question uh, at this point? Right. So some comments here. So it's the first non commutative result on S unit equation. And it is effective. So there are effectively comp computable bounds on the exponents. Uh, and this is effective just because the method I use happens to be effective, which is uh, the Baker's method involving linear forms in algorithm. It is actually one very uh, big industry, and like one, um, it, it, it is the method behind the first effective results on the equation. So this is considered a very standard. <laughs> okay, so and then uh, I will I will say more about how this works uh, upon the request, maybe after the talk and the Q and but. Yes, I, I have that. And then, like, uh, there is a good way to illustrate it just with the just with the toy example as well. Uh, there is a special feature here is a it, it only requires the Archimedean norm, the Euclidean norm, which is Archimedean. Um, so the thing is, the the, the thing that is uh, strange is that you the, usually um, so at first when you start to go to non commutative setting. There is one major difficulty in that you don't have p-adic norms at, anymore. So they are not, uh, except possibly finitely many. But in the classical uh, case of s equation, we do want to use, make use of the, all the Archimedean norms and all the p-adic norms. And the, the reason is that uh, uh, you, want the, you want the geometric uh, Geometric progressions to be to be sparse, okay, um, to be sparse. But sometimes uh, one norm cannot uh, separate them apart, but make them sparse enough. So we need to consider other norms to make them sparse. Um, plenty of time. So um, so here uh, after this comment I'm make room, here I'm going to about one application is in fact the original motivation of the study of unit equation form quaternions. So it has natural consequences in arithmetic dynamic. So dynamic is a su subject that study um, self maps and iterates of self maps. Okay, that is what dynamics is doing. 
Um, and one case that it is very suitable for is when you start with an abelian variety. Okay, so it's like if you, if a variety like iridium curve, but with higher dimension. So the important part is that it's in the morphism ring, the, 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 the ring of the self map, the, the set of self map actually form a ring. The multiplication part is by uh, composition, so exponentiation is iteration of self map, which is quite, which is a which is a natural thing, uh, and, and relates to dynamics. But the point is that the, the variety, a binary variety, is also equipped with a group structure. So you can talk about translation of this variety. So that will give rise to an addition structure in the anamorphism. So now you see that you have you have a multiplication, you have addition, and you want to talk about interplay. This is uh, it is reasonable that uh, S unit theorem on this end of the ring can say something about iteration self and, and translation. And this is the theorem you can get. So let X be an abelian variety with origin O defined over an algebraically closed field. And now here assume that endomorphism X is the subalgebra of some quaternion algebra. So and one important example is when x is a super singular if you curve over a finite field. Okay. So um, then if f and g are self-mapped on x of degree at least 2, uh, note that they don't have to fix O. So they could have been um, isogeneous together with uh, translation. But the point is that the degree has to be at least 2. So fg, one of fg cannot be translation. And in fact, if one of is translation, it will be the same thing is happening. So we, are, we always roll out that in this kind of theory. Okay. And let OFA denote forward orbit. Then if there are two orbits that intersect infinite many times, then it has to be because they have common iterate. By the way, we see that one systematic reason why the orbit can, in, can intersect infinite many times is when they have common iterate, right? So go three times, go two times, you hit again. After six times, it's again, you can do that. So if that happens, it's not a coincidence, it's a systematic reason. But if that doesn't hold, then you know, coincidence could happen to have other unexpected intersections, but they cannot be infinitely often. Right? So, it, so this, uh, it also fits into this thing. And so the whole thing can be reduced to a theorem about unit equation on the endomorphism ring of X. So if endomorphism ring is inside C, then the classical S unit theorem suffices. So this, and this was the idea. And it was proven by Odesky and Ziv in 19. Um, and but the case where you need a quaternion is indeed what motivates the S unit theorem of quaternions. Therefore, I'm going to extend the result. Um, so here I have finished talking about all the results. Since I still have, uh, can I use one more minute? Perfect. So I'm going to say one small thing about uh, an intermediate step or a proof. Um, so here is a, just a recap of the main theorem. So remember, this may be a uh, gamma one, gamma two, and one gamma one to be commutative. What's the reason why we want one of them to be commutative? So it turns out that there's only one reason. So like, th this could potentially be relaxed. What, all, all what I need to use gamma one is this. So there is a, an intermediate step of my proof saying that to prove the main theorem it suffices to prove that this norm equation of quaternion only has finite B many solutions. So note that when you look at this equation, this really means that AXA prime lies in the you know like perpendicular bisector between zero and one. So if you take one half and take the uh, the perpendicular uh, hyperplane to the line connecting 0 and 1. But that is the plane, the, the hyperplane that, uh, that A x A prime lies in. So this is the equation. And you want to show that there's only finitely many solution. Um, but here, I think, I think it definitely has a potential to uh, generalize. Okay. So far, I can only prove this for commutative gamma 1, because I want to use the classical uh, Baker theorem on linear forms of complex numbers. Okay. So, and then if you can generalize this to any other gamma one that is not commutative, this would generalize the main theorem. Okay. Thank you. That's all for my time. That was very good. Does anyone have any questions? It wasn't a very good table that time. Thank you.